Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may know from watching our program in the past, this is a series covering the Sabbath School lessons produced by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is lesson number nine in the series entitled Glimpses of Our God. This particular lesson discusses the subject of Bible and history. And before we begin, I would like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we have a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, <clears throat> we are so thankful that, in fact, you are a part of the history of this world. In fact, the history of this world is really your story. Maybe it's covered and maybe not everybody recognizes it, but we acknowledge it and we want to discover even more clearly the truth of that fact in this time we spend together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson is about how God has interacted with human beings and thus guided human history in a sense. And so I would start out with the question, is human history really just merely a random collection of human activities over a period of time? Is history cyclical? I mean, our clocks go around in circles, and, and you know, we go from January to December, and we you know, come around to January again, and it does seem like a lot of it's cyclical, right? Or is history definitely moving from some significant point in the, his, in the past forward and forward and forward and forward till we actually reach a definite conclusion? How has God interacted with history? And, and to be very honest, we need to also act, ask, how has Satan interacted with human history? What is the role of the great controversy in human history? Hasn't God already won the great controversy? I, I thought God had already won, right? You mean mm -hmm. at the cross? At the cross, sure. So what are we waiting for? Where does it say it already has been won? Well, Jesus said it is finished, didn't he? Well, he said that said more than his, once. His mission was finished. Yeah. Well, what was his mission? To come down and show us what God was like. What else does he need to do? Well, look at this to give us a clue maybe about the role we ought to play. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verses 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now that suggests that there's a definite end point that we're headed for. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? By the way, let me back up for a second. I don't want to spend a long time on this, but do you think that and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Do you think God's going to completely destroy our earth and start over again? That's what it says. <laughs> it, it sounds a little bit like that, doesn't it? <clears throat> of course, he could certainly do that if he wanted to. Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as, as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the, heavenly, when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. So it sounds like who's waiting for who? Well, we should do our part, but um, why should we race to a day when the earth will burn up? Well, Because of what's coming after that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, if you realize that the earth is on a downward spiral and, and, and it was getting more and more sinful all the time, sooner or later you want that to come to an end, don't you? Before, we, before it destroys all of us while we're still here? You know, it, Ken, it does seem like uh, there is a, a cycle to, to history, and I'm not sure, it may be kind of a, an evasive term to say that history repeats itself. Maybe it would be better to say the humans make the same mistakes over and over again. That's happened once or twice. We never but, learn anything. <laughs> but um, certainly when you look at the, the, the Old Testament story of Israel, they kept making the same mistakes. It didn't seem to make any difference how close God came to them. He was in their very presence, visibly, 
uh, uh, you know, there in the desert. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was there. This, yeah. this, there was a, a, a physical presence that would come and go and Miller, was there Clouds constant. And That's Miller, right. Fire. And when it's time to move, why, it moved and you knew what to do and so on and so forth. Um, but they kept making the same mistakes. Um, I, I've wondered about that. Part, uh, but part of it seems to be um, the fact that um, you know, there's a new generation all the time. For example, everyone here in this room, I believe it's safe to say that we all learn to walk better by bumping our heads and skinning our knees and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. That seems to make some sense to us, but when we extrapolate that and think, you know, is that true for nations? Do they go through? You know, do families go through? Does one family go through? Even churches. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, it kind of makes you wonder how how that's supposed to play into well, and eventually into well, judgment, it, it, and how you're judged, and how much you're predestined. And let me tell you the scariest <coughs> part of that in my thinking. God started out with Abraham. I'm sorry, with Adam. He had to basically start over with Noah. He had to start over with Abraham. He finally started over after many years with the Christian Church. Then he had to start over with the Catholic Church, and we Adventists feel like he's done a partial start over with our church. And none of these groups have succeeded in doing God's will. They certainly haven't brought the, the great controversy to a conclusion. What are the chances that we're going to do that? Well, it depends if it's all up to us or not. Do you think it's completely up to us? Well, I read you there. Work, do your best to make it come to an end. Well, that that mm -hmm. is not saying it's all up to us. That means no. help. No, it, no that no. means that means that, that you're helping it mm -hmm. happen. It doesn't mean that it's the exact. It is the thing that's going to make it happen. Yeah. But well, but the other question I got though is, what does it mean by a thief in the night? I don't well, quite understand that because after he says a thief in the night, that that's when the day that happens when when all the everything melts and vanishes and all that, all that happens. The thief in the night is an expression used to I mean you don't know when the thief comes. You basically don't know he's there. You don't want to know when he leaves. That it, is if a, you're sleeping. It's a yeah. It's if a you're awake. It doesn't really matter all that yeah. much. But, it, but it's a complete surprise. Paul was That's talking to fellow believers, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Yeah. So he was telling them. Well, and that. if you read on past that verse, he he says, "You're not supposed to be asleep. You're supposed to be wide awake. You know that the day of the Lord is coming." Well, then why did he even talk about the thief of the night? To oh, just to get because attention. yeah. Well, because in other words, he's saying, you know, so "Don't, so don't you'll be awake." Yeah, exactly. So you'd be awake. <laughs> okay, so some people, <laughs> to some people, it is not going to be like a thief in the night. No, right. That we will know it will come. He says it's not supposed to be to, for us as a thief well, what in the night. What, what, doesn't it come down a little closer to us each one? Your life is as near as your next heartbeat. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that simple. Well, we what don't else? know when it's going to happen. Well, what I'm talking about is when a thief comes, it's a surprise. Yeah. So to us, even though he didn't really say that, uh, to us, it's not going to be a surprise when he comes. Yeah. So we'll see him coming down the road, and uh, it won't be like a thief of, in, in the night for us. If we're paying attention. Maybe. A good cat burglar can get in and out, and you won't know he's been there. <laughs> well, well another aspect of this that has been a major factor in, in history of Christianity is there are verses that seem to suggest in Romans 9, 18 to 21 is one of those examples that seem to suggest that God has it all planned out in advance and we really don't have any free choice. Are we predestined? Well, then it talk about the books being the book mm -hmm. as from when the world, the foundations of the earth. Okay. The Lamb's the, Book of Life written from the foundation of the world, Revelation. We're in it. Mm -hmm. It was put in there before the foundations of the earth. Mm -hmm. So it, um, that's kind of uh, something to consider there. God seems to know <clears throat> in the future because his prophecies, like the book of Job, is a foreshadow, I've heard, of how Jesus suffered on the cross. He felt forsaken like Job felt forsaken. And then in the end times, the end time people will feel, also go through somewhat of a Job experience. Yeah. 
So there's prophecy repeating and it's enlarging each time. And the Babylon in the Old Testament was a small city and in Revelation it seems to characterize all of the evil empires. Yeah. So God seems to know the future and prophecy does sort of repeat in a way. Okay. But, but what, what I'm saying is it, it appears, to answer your question, it appears like you're thinking about two different minds, our mind and God's mind. Yeah. God's mind seems to be able to have knowledge in, in spite of time. We have to have time played out in front of us to actually, to actually know what's going to happen at the end. The question is, in order for God to know in advance, does it have to be predetermined and predestined? That's the question. Well, there, aren't there some aren't there some things which are are predestined? Um, I mean, aren't, aren't I predestined to have brown eyes under some circumstances? Well, okay, let's let's talk about that. <coughs> the word that's translated predestined in the Bible is prohorizo in, in the Greek. It's prohorizo. Horizo is the word from which we get our word horizon. You can recognize the difference. So what it means is that each one of us, even at the point when we were born, there are certain boundaries beyond which we cannot go. I will never be a black woman, for example. See, I will never be, even though I spent many years in Africa, I will never be an African. I will never be an Asian. I will never be, I mean, you know, my eyes will always be blue. That's the way I'm born. So, and each of you could, you know, give your history and say, oh, yeah, this is the way I am and I'm never going to be anything else. And each time, basically, we make a choice, we're eliminating some other possibilities. We're going down one path, which means we're not taking other paths. So, yeah. Isn't it a question of parameters? <coughs> we, we know that from the highest to the low, somewhere in our lifetime, we're going to be given a choice to make given a situation to make a choice. Predestined to me indicates you were pre-programmed like your mm. computer. Yeah. I don't think that's so. Well, well in, in some cases, <clears throat> we can be pre-programmed. We get, there is uh, evidence to indicate that uh, we can be pre-programmed to have a disposition toward alcoholism. Mm -hmm. uh, we can be programmed, pre-programmed to have a disposition toward I can't think of anything else right now, but well, but there are, but, but, but um, I think I think where choice comes in is I is that even though I may have and can correct me on this, and I think it may have some insights into some other you know where, some other things that we're dealing with here, I may have a predisposition because of my ancestry into let's say alcohol, mm -hmm. but I can make some choices. Yeah. And I may not overcome my, my complete um, control over alcoholism in my life. I may go back and forth into that, let us say. But, but this is my perception. The choices I make can make a difference in how my children are predisposed. Yes. And so actually, in a way, I can almost change my genes mm -hmm. by, those, by those choices. And, and um, there's, a net, there's a name for that science. It's called epigenetics. <clears throat> and it's being studied intensively as we speak. Well, I'm glad to know him. But we're also so far told you're not tempted beyond what you're able. Yeah. But, well, I think, but I, think the, I think the answer to your question is no. Does just because God knows the future that, it's, that we're predestined to turn out a certain way? It's just that he is able to see everything in one instant. Mm -hmm. And what he sees in that one instant is still the effects of all our choices down the line. Well, it's hard to understand, but all you have to do, well, I, all you have to do is just take out time, you know, and just have yeah. everything <laughs> condensed into one instant. Yeah. So and he can do that. Um, well, I, I don't know how, but... Let but, me take a biblical example. How did God know that he needed one ark and not a whole fleet of Queen Mary's to save all the people who would want to be saved? Hmm. And why did he have extra room then? Well, <laughs> did. we don't have any evidence that he needed, had extra room. Well, Ellen White said there was plenty of room for other people to get in. Oh, well, I, I mean, uh, some, but not, 
you know, if the whole world had decided if to be it saved. It came out perfect. Yeah, he had 120. <clears throat> he had 120 years to preach, and he ended if up with one family. If the whole world had decided to be saved, there probably there wouldn't, wouldn't have been, been a, a flood. flood. Yeah, well, this is true, of course. That but even need, if half the world decided to be saved. need more room, he would have withheld the flood waters, and Noah could have built another boat. I see. Now, did Eve have the <laughs> choice? to not take the apple or not, or was she predestined? Did Moses have a choice to say, I'm not going to lead those people? And did Jesus have a choice to say, I'm not going to stay on this cross, I'm going to go back home? So how how does this fit with this this history uh, repeating itself here in the scriptures? Well, as Christians, we tend to say, we tend to believe that the Bible is the most accurate and comprehensive in terms, of, in terms of all the way back and all the way forward, history that we have available to us. Now, some of our friends, who of course, would dispute that in terms of its accuracy. I would say it's very accurate. The question is, 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 it, is it a distorted report? Is it, is it a biased report? By, by accurate, do you mean historical or do you mean, I mean truthful? Or? I mean historically accurate right now. We're talking about historically accurate. <clears throat> Well, maybe not historically complete. No, okay, and that's everything. the important point. Okay. It do, there's a lots that, of things it do, doesn't say. But what is in there is telling the truth. And that's the question. Is it, and, and the next question I'm asking here is, did, does it tell the story in a way that distorts the picture? Or is the, is the picture accurate based on, on what we have in Scripture? Because maybe well, it's something it, we don't it think depends about. depends on your... May depend on your particular disposition. I happen to think it's very accurate, and I think there's evidence for that. There's been times in the past when we didn't think it was accurate. We'd read Daniel, for example, and we'd read about Nebuchadnezzar, and there was a time when, in the evolution of of mankind, we got to the place where we'd get around more, we could explore more. We had more, and, and, and the evidence seemed to indicate there never was a person like Nebuchadnezzar. There, that, right here was the only place, and mm-hmm. so they believe that there wasn't a Nebuchadnezzar. After all, it's a weird name, and so then you can't believe this Bible, but there was some people who believed that, and they began to get out and snoop around, and eventually they, they dug the guy up. Mm-hmm. And, and especially his grandson, <coughs> uh, Belshazzar, that uh, people for sure that he didn't exist. There was books and papers all written about you can't trust the book of Daniel until all of a sudden someone dug up a little cylindrical uh, uh, little clay cylinder with cuneiform writing on it and lo and behold there's the name of Belshazzar and everybody, oh sorry we made a mistake. So when you have those kinds of experiences or you're aware of that, at least for me, when I come to parts in the Bible that are kind of head scratchers. I've learned that there's been head scratchers before, and there have been answers to those if you're just patient enough. Is is the Bible pretty clear? And and how do you feel about this? That God created everything in the beginning. Now you know this is a huge issue, and we're not going to talk about all the e- <coughs> details of evolution tonight. But do you have any questions about? I mean, is 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 the Bible itself? If you take the Bible biblical record. Is it clear that God created? It couldn't be more clear because it even says morning and evening, mm-hmm. or evening and morning, whichever well, that's way. Just a little piece of data right there, but we don't know anything of how He did it. Well, no, we're not talking about how He did it. The well, question is, did He do it? You're kind of going that way when you're saying, "Is it clear?" And some people say, "No, it's not clear because we don't know how He did it." So, so you know, what are you going to say? To repeat the experiment. It's, is it's, that what? <laughs> it's clear that He did it. Well, the Bible is clear that it says that he did it. Yeah, that's that's true. Here's here's the tricky part. Let's be honest. The people who don't want to believe that God created, the real reason why they don't want to believe that is because they they don't want to believe God has anything to do with the ending either. They don't want to think that someday they're going to face judgment. Well, they they got an ending anyway, no matter what they do. Well, you know, if, if, if the whole world just blows up or, it, or, we, or we freeze to death because the sun burns out, okay, I mean, that's going to a long time well, after well, how us. How about and like no, just getting old and dying? 
Yeah, even I mean, that, it's still an end. That's fine. That, that is yeah. still an you know, end. It's, it's a, it is a... That's not the same as facing a judge. If you get in and you read, mm. if you get in and you read this book, mm. uh, that is not just a topic of the first two or three chapters of no. Genesis. That is from beginning to end. Every author talks about that in one way or another, that, that God is the maker of things and the creator of, of this planet. And uh, that's the, the core of our, of our relationship yeah. with him. They also, we see the full character of individuals. We don't see the perfect character of each one. We see the other side of them where they made mistakes. And mm -hmm. I think that adds authenticity <coughs> to it because it's not just the, the better parts of life that are getting recorded. Yeah, exactly. Well, down through history, God has also made many predictions. How does he do that? How can he predict something that's going to hap happen hundreds of years in advance and get it exactly right? He knows our genes. <laughs> he knows our genes. <laughs> because he's God. That's right. That's yeah. One of the he's unique. Problems. Well, does that imply, here's, here's the toughie, does that imply that he can predict in advance our free choices? In that case, are they not free, really? I think he knows, but if you take a little further, we'll go back to being predetermined. If, if it is, why we bother with trying to get other people on board for salvation? Yeah. So the person that named Cyrus, mm -hmm. And Darius, they didn't have any choice in the matter? Well, most of us don't have any choice in, the, in, in our own name, do we? No, no, I'm not talking about the people <laughs> that ended up with the name. You know, he predicted those names three and four hundred years, so now Joanne gives birth, and here is the guy that's supposed to be Cyrus. She has no choice. She just doesn't even know it. She just blurts it out because... Named him Cyrus? Yeah. yeah, because that's just, God said that's what she was going to do, and so that's the way it is. How do you, how do you come up with choice yeah. there? I think Nebuchadnezzar at the end, he had finally <clears> got <throat> it figured out, and some of those earlier world-dominant leaders, some of those were absolutely ruthless. Some of them weren't quite so ruthless. So what I'm saying is there's a difference here and there would indicate something happened in their life. At what, when, we, when we talk about choice, uh, does it make any difference whether she had the choice to name him Cyrus or Billy? I mean, really. Well, the, if, if, the question when, is not the naming. The question is what he does with his life. That's right. Well, but I mean, I mean it, it's predicted that his, his, name, is his name is going to be Cyrus, and okay. somebody has to name him that. And so and the question the is, did the person who named him that yeah. have any choice in that? And... Um, is, well, is the power of choice, is it, no. is, it, is, it, is it important whether you have the, the control over that or of something else? Well, the father of John the Baptist mm -hmm. theoretically had choice, but in reality he didn't on what to name John. He, he was all, aphasic yeah. until, until the name was mm -hmm. decided to be John, yeah, even though that wasn't decide? the name of the family. How did he decide it, though? He was told. Yeah. Told, well, God that's told. different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So in that, in that case, just the name was predetermined. Have you ever tried to predict the future? <laughs> <laughs> People do in well, Vegas you, all the time. You, and you can horse up races. to a point, can't you? How accurately? If you're good at it, uh, I'll take you to Wall Street and we'll make a lot of money. Between. Well, I, I bet you I can predict the future. If I go over there and turn that light switch off, these lights will go off. Yeah, but who cares about that? Oh, well, well I'm still predicting the future. Come want, on, want, come I on. You pretty. asked, can I predict the future? I can. I, Up I to a point, you can. Yeah. The thing sort of semi-allied to this that I've wondered, I think God knows what's coming. If the devil can get Christ up on the top of the temple steeple and show him all the kingdoms to come, now whether it was all, we don't know. But if he could do that, I uh, know God's got a good idea. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at uh, predicting some things, um, saying if such and such happens, then this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and so on and so okay, forth. So that's but, but, but I can't make that happen. I, I can be wrong. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> that, that's one of the one of the tricky parts here because some people and, would and if say, I am right, I always rub it in. Yes. <laughs> God, God. Some people have looked at God and said <clears throat> God is like a gargantuan computer. He knows if you make this choice, this is going to be the consequence. You make that choice, that's going to be the consequence. He doesn't know the future except that he knows all the possible choices, and so he can sort of predict that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he certainly has that capability, but I don't think that... That's not the limit. That is not what he is dependent well, on. There's some people that even question if there's a such thing as randomness, yeah. that everything can be predicted if you had enough data. And, yeah, um, yeah. and so you can get into these philosophies and go clear off into the who knows what. It's kind of hard to tell, but I know f from me that I don't know what's going to happen. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm making my own choices. <laughs> okay, that's that's to, what I'm worried it, about. We need to keep moving because... Well, does it say in the Bible that God ever made a mistake? or? Not that I'm aware of. No. He was sorry that he made man. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He did create are, or if he Lucifer. He repented. Yeah. In other words, he yeah. did something different. Well... One of the questions would be, if God can see all our futures in advance, does he mistreat the people he knows that are going to be lost? He hasn't. No. The story of Judas is a classic example. Judas, you know, went back and forth. He, he, he knew that Jesus had the ability to do everything that Judas wanted him to do, but Jesus just wouldn't do it. He even... Judas tried to force Jesus to do what he wanted him to do. He said, you could be king if you just get your act together. What's wrong with you? You know, that was Judas's attitude. And when Jesus washed his dirty feet on that, in the upper room that uh, Thursday night, at first he was, he was almost ready to confess his sin because he had already made a contract with the Pharisees and Sadducees he was going to betray Jesus. And then he thought, how can a person who's supposed to be a king be down here washing dirty feet? And he said, this can't be. Can't be. He's never going to get his act together. He's, he's, he's not going to make it. That's it. You can read about that in Desire of Ages, page 645. Um, how, did, how did God treat the nations who rebelled against him? The special chosen nations, Israel and Judah. He was sending them prophets, a lot of prophets, up until the very day when they were, and, and, and he, he tells Hosea in Hosea 11, 7 and 8. In fact, we ought to just look at that. Look at Hosea 11, 7 and 8. They insist on turning away from me, God says. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How, and then God's response, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma, or treat you as I did Zeboim? Now, Adma and Zeboim were small towns that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. What does that tell us about how God feels about having to let people go sometimes? He's in anguish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Old Testament. Did he, feel, did he feel? He feel that way about people that weren't Israelites? Did he feel that way about the Moabites? Did he feel about that about the he Chinese sent, over in? Well, he sent three prophets just to the Assyrians, just to Nineveh. They didn't all go to Nineveh, but they pro Jonah went to Nineveh, and the other prophets prophesied about Nineveh. They weren't Israelites. And then God seemed to claim that all these bad things, these armies coming in to Israel, was his doing. Yeah. And he, 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 he says there, I instructed Nebuchadnezzar to do this and that. I told uh, the, the, the Nineveh, the people, the Ninevites, the Assyrians to come and do this and this. And then some places they even go so far as to say, well, they did more than what I wanted them to do. <laughs> his enemies. That's a very interesting thing. Well, if God created in the beginning, is he, does he want us to take the attitude of, of a deist? The deist, you know, believe that God sets everything in motion and then he goes off for a long vacation. Is that the way it works? Or, or is God active every day in our lives? He's active. 
I love these words. This is one of my favorite quotations from the Review and Herald, December 2 of 1890, paragraph 15. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. In other words, those rules, that gravity and all the, the, the strong force and the weak force and the, all the stuff that makes everything work, the chemistry laws and the physics laws, those are all made by God and they work because God makes them work instant by instant. Otherwise, they would not work. Well, human beings have come up with many different ideas about how God is related to human history. We've already mentioned deism. There are others, of course, many ancient civilizations believe that the, the whole thing was just cyclical. And, and, and some religions even today believe that, you know, there's reincarnation and the whole thing just goes around and around. Well, you know, if everything is from God is that involved in keeping us alive, also then God is feeling tremendous pain as a child gets hurt, mm -hmm. as an accident happens or a sickness happens, he's also in the midst of that too. So sometimes I wonder how God can stand the pain of the world. Yeah, really. Well, evolutionists, of course, um, deny that God had anything to do with creation. They, most of them would just flatly say God doesn't exist. They don't think God has anything to do with the future demise of our world. Just leave God out of it completely as far as they're concerned. But... Uh, what, what makes them think that? What, why, why is it they that they... They want to think that. They want to think that because they don't want to face the possibility that someday they will stand before a, a judge who will judge them for their behavior. Well, not... Not all of them. You I don't know, think you can put everybody. I don't care. R really, don't reverb about that one way or the other. I well, that that that's the that's the, way they that's the way they want to feel. No, they, no, they, they really don't. I mean, they they don't. They just think everything's natural. Yeah, no, I, I agree There's with no, that. I'm not arguing with that. Yeah. I, but but my point is, if you said to them, you know, stop for a second. I'm telling you, one day you will stand before God's judgment seat and he will judge you for everything you've ever done or thought or so forth. And they would say, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I, I heard someone actually in a Sabbath school class last week say that, that Darwin was a believer. He was a... His father was a preacher. He was a, he was a believer before he, he did his work and he was a believer after. But the thing that was a puzzle to him <clears throat> was, you know, the, the big fish are eating the little fish. And he didn't know how to get around that. And then the, the teacher followed that up by saying that he just didn't have a picture of the great controversy. Well, absolutely. That's absolutely true. Also, he didn't understand a lot about <laughs> the At least what basic we call the great life either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting that Isaiah way back, what, 700 years before Jesus came to this earth even, uh, spoke on behalf of God. And in, in chapters 40 to 55, he talks about how you can identify a real God. And there's two main points he makes. There's three, but there's two big points he makes. The first one is, a real God is alive and can command creation out of nothing. That's his first point. His second point is, a real God can predict the future far in advance. He even challenges the other gods. He says, you're a God? Come here and predict something for me and we'll see if it happens. It is very interesting. Yeah. Now, what was this? I mean, where, what basis does he have for that? <laughs> other, than, other than it just seems right. Well, you mean, how, what basis does Isaiah have? Yeah. Oh, because yeah. his his children were predictions. When they were born, God says, before this kid is old enough to say, Mommy and Daddy, such and such and such will happen. And it did. Well, I still think the basis is faith at the beginning. Well, uh, yeah, but uh, how many times do you have to see, okay, here's a prediction. There it happened. Here's a prediction. There it happened. How many times do you have to see that before you start saying, hmm? But no matter how many you have, there's always opportunity for... Yes. For... Um, exactly. 
But so where do you but if you if you take that approach, you should never drive on the street. You should never walk anywhere. You well, should never enter a scared. building. I'm no. not saying scared. I'm just saying that uh, there's an opportunity for doubt. Yeah, oh, there's always an opportunity for doubt. Sure. Where, well, that's where faith will be complete in that. And where, it's got to be a decision. Where are you going to get that information that God can create from nothing and that he can predict the future? Where do you, where do you, well, go, where do you, if I were to go out on the, on the, corner at tomorrow morning and put up a little soapbox or something and preach this, mm -hmm. the people that are listening to me, where are they going to get, how are they going to get that information? They're, they're, God, doesn't, God doesn't come down to their lives each day and, and create a flower right there in well, front of them, you, and he doesn't... Do you believe history <clears throat> is reliable? I guess what I'm saying is that, is you're going to have to go here to get that information. Well, you're going to have to go here if you want to get the predictions. If you want to get the fulfillments, you can get it, you can go into history. Uh, it, it'll be in there as well, but if you if you don't want to trust this, you can get the information for a lot of the predictions. You can get the, the the fulfillments, you can get it out of history. You don't need to go to the Bible. Look at Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, 9, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, I could just go on and on. There, there are a lot of short-term predictions, and there are some really long-term predictions. Look at the book of Revelation. Where are they, they going to get, where are we going to get evidence that he created? Is there any evidence today that, I mean, going to go out and look on the front porch here? Oh, there's an example of, of the, this has been created from nothing. Well. From the books of Moses. Yeah. From the Genesis. Mm -hmm. I can show you the seed of a little pepper plant and what happens to it when it grows up. Mm -hmm. To me, that's creating something, well, maybe out of almost nothing. It's just yeah. a little... So maybe, maybe although you can't see it absolutely pure, there's enough... I mean, when you see something like that, mm -hmm. um, there's enough message there as some sort of inspiration. That's you, why faith is important. We're probably aware that um, critics have tried to discount the book of Daniel. They've tried every method you could possibly imagine. The most successful has probably been, at least in modern times, they have said, well, Daniel was not really written by Daniel, and there's all sorts of reasons why they listed why Daniel couldn't have been written by Daniel. Almost every one of those reasons have been discounted, have been proven wrong, and there's almost nothing left. But one of them, they still believe it. They still believe it. They still believe it. They believe that Daniel was written around 165 B.C., and that it happened after much of the predictions that were made in the book of Daniel had already taken place. And what they don't take account of is the fact that it predicts that the... the the Roman government is going to rise. Now, it doesn't mention it by name. It says this government is going to rise very powerful, etc., rule the world a long period of time, and it's going to de fall apart into ten kingdoms, and they're not going to stick together. How would you know that if you had written in 165? You had seen nation rise, another nation rise, another nation rise. There is no way you could know as a human being that Rome was going to fall apart the way it did. They just teach it as a bunch of fables. Yeah, and, and furthermore, we have copies of the book of Daniel that are essentially what we have now that are written, that were copied just a few years after this 165 B.C. And there's not even any hint in there that there was any problem. And furthermore, if you come down to uh, two, three hundred years after Christ, to the times of Jerome, who translated the, the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate uh, and produced what what has since been the the predominant Catholic Bible, he said, look at Daniel. It, he predicted the coming of Jesus, etc. He, he, he read Daniel correctly. He knew the answers way back then. So why, why, why do we have so much trouble with it now? Why don't people find it comforting that there is a God who knows the future rather than disturbing? To me, it's comforting well, to... In, in the days when the church dominated everything, people tried to every way they could to get out from under its dominance. That was part of it. But our time is running out. I want to keep moving. Let's talk a little bit more about the great controversy. 
What is, what is the great controversy? <clears throat> what does that mean to you when someone says great controversy? A great disagreement. It's the story behind the story. Now, many people will tell us, well, there's a battle going on, constantly a battle going on between good and bad. Is that what we're talking about? That's what some people term it as, mm -hmm. some churches. The most prominent book on it is the great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels, mm -hmm. which implies uh, Daniel, excuse me, Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you have a controversy, that means there's an argument going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's more than just a conflict between good and evil. As, as Jim said, it's between God and his angels and Satan and his angels over <coughs> the character and government of God. There was someone who wrote a book back in the days of our, our church was being founded, entitled The Great Controversy Between God and Man, basically. That was a controversy. We're the evil ones and God is the good one. It's his story, uh, orig excuse me, it's origin, history, and end or something yeah. like that, but it fell in the name of Hastings. Yeah. But it's just a very, it's, it's more or less about Israel. Yeah. It has doesn't, the great plan that Ellen White talked yeah. about. He doesn't even Ellen understand White, it. Ellen White, one of the founders of our church, of course, has an incredible uh, presentation of what we call the Great Controversy. Of course, her, her five-volume masterpiece is called the Conflict of the Ages series and uh, sets it all out very well and, and basically says that the Great Controversy is a battle between Satan and his angels and their accusations and claims against God and God's attempt to answer those accusations and claims in a decisive, clear, definite way that we can, we can, we can believe. And that controversy, of course, started out in, the, in, in human history, the human history part of it, uh, back in Genesis 2.17 and 3.1-4, where God says, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what does Satan say? You will not die. It's a lie. But he was lying in heaven. Yeah, well, thousands of years earlier. Sure, sure. Yeah. But people have to know that this great controversy we're talking about is it's different than the Mormon great mm -hmm. yeah. controversy. Um, I started talking about this to somebody, and they thought I was a Mormon. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's there's two different types of stories, oh, there's even big more. picture stories, that's prevalent here. Mm -hmm. And um, and so don't put them all together. They're they're different. So I come back to the question I raised earlier: Has God won the great controversy? Now think about everything we've said. Don't don't just give me a snap There's answer. There's a big question that's still there. What is? What it? do you do with the sinners? How do you put them down? And it's mm -hmm. still being just. I would. Say How does that happen? Mm -hmm. I would say yes. In one of the church papers, there was an interesting article, and I'd never thought of it. It said, why do people accept things from Satan? He has already lost everything. Mm -hmm. That, to me, answers it right there. But the still, father of lies. What, yeah. what are you going to do with them? What with are you going to do with them? Yeah, what are you going to do with them? Well, I actually have a 50-page, actually almost 60-page document from the Bible and Ellen White answering that very question. Should we, should we bring it? Do you, think, <laughs> do you think everybody's going to understand that when the time comes? We will have when, the time, when the time comes, they will understand it. Everyone will understand yes. it. Yes. Had their chance. So yeah. that's, people don't understand it yet, and that's my answer. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that. Yeah. I no, think I, that's true. I think when the Day of Judgment comes, everybody will know what they should have Well, done. and where's the evidence for that? The best single verse for that is, is Philippians 2. Uh, maybe we ought to just look at that for a second. Uh, let's go to Philippians 2 and verses 10 and 11. Yeah, I wonder if maybe God should just take the bad ones and just burn them forever. Well, listen to what it says here. And so in <laughs> honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below. Now, who does that leave out? No one. Nobody. Everybody, even Satan himself now, will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, here's another prediction. It certainly hasn't happened yet. So, is God right? Is it going to... Is that the point up? where everybody's saved, though? 
This is the point where everyone will say, God, you gave us a chance. We didn't all vote for you, but you gave us a chance. So it's not saving everybody. No. It's just it's the separation and people understand why they're one place and not the other. Mm -hmm. The great controversy is not over because the book of Hebrews tells what Jesus is doing now during this delay. Mm -hmm. And if, there, if Jesus was through, then the great controversy would be ending. And here's another really important point, and, and let me take uh, just a... Uh, just thinking about how much I should take time for. Uh, look at Ephesians... Um, let's go to chapter 3, um, verse, starting with verse 7, and it will give us a clue about how big this controversy is. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift. This is, of course, this is Paul speaking. By God's special gift, which he gave me through, his work, through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ, and of making all people see how God's secret plan, that's what we're talking about here, God's secret plan, is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, now here's an example of how Paul clearly believed God was the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the ages, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, who's included in that? Church. All of us. We all claim to be members of the church, don't we? So that's us plus everybody else who claims to be a member of the church. The, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. And if you go to Colossians 1, 19, 20, we'll tell you that, that the answers were really given by Christ's uh, life and death. So we, as Christians, are supposed to be teaching the universe something about God through our understanding of what happened on the cross. That's pretty impressive kind of stuff. Verse, and, what are we supposed to be teaching? Did you see, look at uh, verse 9 and, and the Greek and see if men is in there or you read people in that translation. Yeah, you want to know if, if the Greek is... If the Greek has men or people... Making, uh, be, right at the beginning of verse 9? Uh, where, where, which yeah, which uh -huh. people are you talking about? And to make all see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for the nation. Is men or people really in there? Or is that uh, supplied? And verse 9, verse hold nine. on just a second. We'll come up here. So this is Greek. We're now looking at Greek and a lot of information about the Greek. It says all, pantas. Okay. And that means it could be people, yeah. It, well, it's John people. twelve thirty two. I, right. if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto myself. Yeah. It, and the King no, James supplied to men. So men is not in there, and no. here's now we have another parallel. No, it's, it's, it's not in here. <coughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's not in so here. So he'll draw all to himself. Because it, this earth was created as a theater stage, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, to show how evil works for the heavenly beings that hung around. And we need to recognize that the great controversy the battle we're talking about, the accusation from Satan against God's government, began where? In heaven. In heaven, in God's sanctuary, right beside God's throne. And why? There was war in heaven. Yeah, war why, in why did it? Why did it happen? Because, I maintain, because God is love. Yeah. And God has choice. He creates creatures, intelligent creatures that have the capacity to choose, mm -hmm. and if you have to have the capacity to choose, you either go in harmony with the Creator's way things are meant to run, or you choose the wrong path. Yeah. Was, there, was there ever a chance that God could lose? Yeah. If, if Jesus Christ had sinned, the whole, I believe if Jesus Christ had sinned, if he had fallen, I think the great controversy would have been, God would have lost the great controversy, Satan would have claimed victory, and I think ultimately, the universe would have, fall, have, have been inclined to follow Satan's sat satanic, selfish ways, and the whole universe would eventually come unglued, fall apart, destroy itself. Now, what is happening now? Is it that the angels above are being shown how Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit can change sinful human beings into citizens of heaven? That's a major part of it, yes. Look at... Look at this, thousands of years after sin began in heaven, 
Jesus came and lived his exemplary life and died that cruel death to show that God has told us the truth. Sin does lead to death. And notice these very, very instructive words from Desire of Ages, page 761, pages 2 and 3. I mean, paragraph 2 and 3. Satan saw, now this is to the death, just, just immediately following the death of Christ. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. She's trying to explain here what the great controversy is all about and why it's important Jesus died the way he did and so forth. And she's talking all about where? Not about this earth. She's talking about heaven and heavenly things. Henceforth, his work was restricted. This is talking about Satan still. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came forth from the heavenly courts and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. In other words, as far as the heavenly universe was concerned, the great controversy was what? Over. It was over. It was over. As far as the rest of the universe is concerned, it was answered because they saw what happened there on Calvary. All we saw was blackness for three hours. We didn't, we didn't have a clue what was going on. They watched God and they watched the devil. They watched God's angels. They watched the devil's angels. They saw every detail of that and they knew exactly what was going on. Satan had told them that he was really a good guy with mm -hmm. legitimate complaints. And then they saw that he was actually a murderer and he murdered another yeah. one of murdered Satan, Jesus. Yeah. Satan was in a catch-22. Can you describe that catch-22? Before the cross or after the cross? Up until Jesus was dead. He couldn't get Jesus to sin. Well, his, his first choice was always to try to get Jesus to sin. Then he would have claimed victory. If he couldn't get Jesus to sin, his next choice was what? Have Jesus abandon us. Have Jesus give up, say, this is too much trouble, it's not worth it, go back to heaven and maybe abandon this earth to Satan, perhaps, or something like that. That was the second choice. What was his third choice? This one's not so well known. His hope was, and you can read it, this is all straight out of Desire of Ages. His hope was, when Jesus was dead, that he could keep him in the grave never let him come up again. He lost all of those battles. And when it was all over and the angels saw Jesus come forth in his own power and return to heaven, they knew it's all over for Satan. You know, it's kind of mind-boggling to think of the strength of Jesus when you think of all those that he, how he foiled say, Satan in all three of those. We would have failed in any one of them yeah. many times over. How, well, how could he keep him in, in the grave? Is, well, is it just power or it, just claim? Yeah, it or was it his claim that anybody who was dead belonged to him. Jesus died not only the first death, he died the second death. And Satan would say, that's the results of sin. Jesus is treated as a sinner. He's mine. Leave him alone. His body, it belongs to me now. Yet he said at the beginning that Jesus said that he can lay down his life and take it back up again. Sure. So Satan was that denying was, that whole thing. That was moot before he yeah. even started. <laughs> well, it, sure, you can say that. And what we know historically, according to Desire of Ages, again, I'm expanding on what the scripture says, two angels came down. The two angels who had been guardian angels for Jesus all his life. One of them is Gabriel. We don't know the name of the other one. Um, but he comes, the two of them come down. One of them rolls back the stone, and the other one says, Jesus, your father calls you, and he came forth in his own power, his own divinity. He rose in his own divinity and came out of that grave, and, 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 and Satan was furious. He was so angry, and Satan's entire host was, were just hovered over that grave. They were doing everything they possibly could, could do to prevent God's angels from getting through. But, you know, the Bible tells us how the, the, um, you know, the Roman guard you know, fell like dead men. It wasn't just the Roman guard, it was Satan's entire host that fled 
when those two angels came in God's power, they could not withstand it. They just, they were gone. And Jesus came forth and it was all over. And we read on here, yet Satan was not then destroyed. And notice these very important words. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The who didn't? The angels. They had seen it and they still didn't understand. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, that's all of us, Satan's existence must be continued. Why? Man as well as angels must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. Well, uh, here's the verses. If you want to read more, read Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. We just read those verses. And also Colossians 1, 19, 20, and of course, Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69. Great Controversy chapter 29, too. Yeah. This earth is not an isolated island. We may be the only place in the universe where sin exists, but the entire universe is focusing their attention on us and how the sin problem will be resolved. And of course, that's 1 Corinthians 4, 9. What do you suppose is it that a, why do you suppose is it that a humble carpenter from an obscure village who left his carpenter's bench and preached and healed for three and a half years and then died a cruel death became the dividing point in human history? Well, the whole doctrine of salvation can be expressed in this one sentence our Bible study guide says, God cancels our hopelessly stranded history and it's in its place puts his history. Mm -hmm. And you wonder exactly what it means by that. Our sins are laid upon Christ. What does that mean? The truth is that God come, came down. He answered the questions in the great controversy. And he makes it clear to us, or he tries to make it clear to us, that we have a choice. We can choose to live lives like Jesus lived. Or we will die the death which Jesus died. That's really what the great controversy ultimately is all about. Sin pays its wage. The wage is death, Romans 6.23. And we are all sinners, Romans 3.23. There's no, no question about, there's no question about what we deserve. But there's a question about what we may become if we were, cooperate with God. And we are, while we're running out of time, people who wrote history almost never write it in a way that reflects badly upon themselves. What about us? It's been 167 years since the Great Disappointment, and we're still here. Why are we still here? When will we finally get our act together? When will we get prepared? When will that marvelous group called the 144,000 form? You could be a part of it, and so could I. See you next week.